There's no doubt in my mind when I have like poured over the data that an average person who got infected and got sick enough to be hospitalized, let's say in March in New York, that person probably has a 30 to 50% lower likelihood of dying today. That's amazing. Hello and welcome to G Zero World. I'm Ian Bremmer. And after what felt like the longest campaign in US history, the big day finally arrived. And then it went. And then we still had no idea who had won the presidential election. As of this taping, the final result was still undecided. This is an embarrassment to our country. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. It's not my place or Donald Trump's place to declare who's won this election. That's the decision of the American people. But one thing is clear. The inauguration will not mark the end of the most important story for all of us this year. That's the pandemic. And with flu season and winter barreling towards us, my guest today says that battle is far from over. I'm talking the leading pandemic response expert, Dr. Ashish Jha. It's spreading, maybe even faster and wider than the virus itself. Pandemic fatigue. Nine months, at least 45 million cases worldwide, well over a million deaths, nonstop media coverage, shutdowns, and staying six feet apart. Here's the story. It's COVID, COVID, COVID. You can't watch anything else. On November 4th, you won't be hearing so much about it. Not exactly. But it is true that people are tired. The Wall Street Journal reported recently that collective exhaustion is threatening containment efforts, even in some countries that had gotten infection rates well under control. What does that mean, you ask? Well, humans are sliding back into being the social animals we are. While the number of people who say they're wearing masks has gone up, a Gallup poll also found that from May to September, the number of Americans avoiding gatherings with family and friends declined from nearly two thirds to less than half. And that's a trend that's playing out in Europe as well. The World Health Organization even issued guidelines to help European leaders handle populations that have had it with social distancing. At the top of the list of strategies, understand people. Good luck with that. But as human hosts relax, the virus itself has gone into overdrive. Numbers are spiking, particularly in the Americas and in Europe. France and Germany have gone into lockdown again, France announcing a nationwide shutdown rivaling the early days of the outbreak. Russia, now fourth in the world for overall coronavirus cases, has made mask wearing mandatory. Apparently, President Vladimir Putin's personal disinfection tunnel, that's what they call it, didn't quite do the trick for everyone else. There are a few global bright spots, countries like South Korea, Japan, and even China, where it all began. They've avoided big spikes in the recent months. Experts cite widespread compliance with health guidelines, aggressive testing, or both. Neither of those are true across the United States. Wisconsin, known as a political battleground, has also become the latest epicenter for the pandemic here, with both infections and death tolls climbing rapidly. Rural hospitals in the Rocky Mountains and parts of the Midwest are at a breaking point, and the nation continues to see record numbers of new cases as we head into November. It all means anybody hoping this year's online sign brings an end to the Anas Horribilis needs to think again. Just how different will 2021 be? Well, that depends on how fast the new plague, pandemic fatigue, spreads and how hard societies are willing to keep working to control the virus. And that's the topic for today's big interview. Dr. Shish Jha, he is Dean of the Brown University School of Public Health. It's wonderful to have you on G0, sir. Thank you for having me on. So I wanna start uh, where I left things off in my monologue on this idea of pandemic fatigue. Right now we're seeing an average of about 85 to 90,000 daily cases in the United States. 
Uh, and as Dr. Fauci said last weekend, the stars are all aligned in the wrong places as it gets colder and we head into winter. Um, how much of what we're seeing right now is literally people just getting tired of the virus? So I think it's two or three things. Certainly one of them is people getting tired of the virus. It's been a long haul, nine, 10 months of this stuff. And I think uh, that's definitely a part of it. I think another part of it is the sheer amount of misinformation that people are dealing with. Lots and lots of uh, misinformation about how serious the virus is, how it's spread. And the last thing is I don't feel like we in public health have done a good enough job of helping people understand risk. Uh, one of the things that leads to fatigue is if you feel like you can't do anything at all safely, then you end up sort of throwing up your hand and saying, well, I don't care. I'm going to do all of it. Uh, but of course, lots of things are safe. Some things are less so. And we've got to do a better job of helping people understand so they can make better choices. So speaking of that, I mean, you know, you know it's very easy to imagine, you know, Everyone should wear a mask all the time if they're in public. Everyone should be socially distant. But if you are a young, healthy person um, and, you know, you're not in, you, you know, you're not living with people who have uh, pre-existing conditions or are 70 plus, talk a little bit about what you think is a reasonable way to live your life. Yeah, so the problem is if you're imagine you're a 25 year old, or you're a healthy person, you're not living with your parents, uh, you may be living by yourself or with other 20 year olds or 20 something year olds. Um, the the problem becomes that that if you just say, all right, the pandemic is not going to affect me, I'm just going to not worry about it. First of all, there's a good chance if you get infected, it's true, you're likely to do okay. But you have a period of time of five to 10 days of infectiousness, of which several days you're not even aware that you have any symptoms, during which time you can spread it to somebody in the grocery store. You can spread it to somebody uh, who, who then can spread it to an older person. So it's hard even for a 25-year-old who may not be at high risk to remember that they're not in an, on an island and that they, what they do will end up affecting everybody else. Now, that doesn't mean they need to be in lockdown, right? So when they go outside and they're hanging out with friends outside, that's fine, that's pretty safe. If you're gonna go inside and spend time with people, really do have to wear that mask. There's a lot of things we can do socially, but unfortunately in the middle of a pandemic, we can't act like uh, life is normal, even if you're a perfectly healthy 25 year old. So then, I mean, uh, being here in New York City, let me give you a, for instance, I mean, right now, you have restaurants across the city that have 25% occupancy inside. It is gonna get colder. Um, and when you are eating, you are not wearing a mask. You have no idea who these other people are. Are you saying that no one should actually be doing that? Is that an unacceptable uh, a level of epidemiological risk from your perspective? In New York City, where the level of infection is still relatively low, at 25% indoor dining, it's probably not super high risk. Uh, depends a little bit on who you're having you know, dinner with. Uh, and also depends a lot on what the restaurant's doing to try to mitigate in terms of ventilation and can they open windows. Now, I know it's getting colder, but you can crank up the heat and make sure there's a reasonable amount of ventilation. That stuff helps a lot actually make indoor dining safe. Bars are pretty much a disaster. Uh, the problem with bars is um, they involve alcohol. And when people drink, they start being careful and they start getting close and they start uh, speaking more loudly. And, and so there's a bunch of reasons why I don't see any way to justify having bars open during this pandemic. But 25% indoor dining in a place that doesn't have a large outbreak with reasonable ventilation, yeah, like that's pretty, pretty safe. Now, Ashish, you, you've been very critical publicly of the United States government not handling this coronavirus well. We are, we are the global hotspot, and we have mismanaged this virus in a way that I think much of the world uh, simply can't believe. I, I want to ask you, I'm looking right now at the European Union, and I am seeing uh, not only overall uh, levels, but also per capita levels of cases and of deaths significantly higher than here in the United States. Explain that to me. Yeah. Um, so this is one where, uh, I'll be honest with you, I got it wrong. I really thought the Europeans had learned their lesson from that first wave, and they would never let themselves kind of be subject to another large wave of infections. And what Europe did do, and again, Europe is not a country, there's a lot of variation across countries in Europe, but 
broadly speaking, they got hit by a lot of infections and hospitalizations and deaths in April and May and March, April, May. They locked down pretty aggressively and the summer was pretty mellow. They did well during the summer with very few cases. What happened was in early to mid-August, cases started rising because the virus hasn't gone away. The pandemic is with us. And my assumption was that the European governments would look at those and say, then they would act the way East Asian countries have done, or New Zealand and Australia have done, which is they would react, they would stop certain types of activities, they would keep the virus under control. In fact, that's not what has happened. Places like UK, France, Spain, essentially acted like the pandemic was over. And uh, and through mid-August, through early to mid-October, you just saw this constant increases in cases. And by mid-October, it was very clear that Europe was having another wave of, of infections. If you look at France, the United Kingdom, for example, right now, Spain, do you actually say, you know what, they, their governments have actually done no better, maybe even worse than the Trump administration? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, they did have a better summer than us. Uh, at least there's that. Uh, though America is a funny country, right? Because in many ways, uh, there are parts of the United States that look just like Europe in the sense that they had a pretty good summer, uh, certainly in New England, parts of the Midwest. But I think you can make a compelling case that the United Kingdom has not done meaningfully better than the United States, uh, that France and, and Spain have not done overall meaningfully better. Uh, so while the Trump administration, certainly on a global scale, has done a pretty abysmal job, uh, there are other high-income countries uh, with well-functioning societies that are pretty competitive with the United States uh, for mismanagement of the virus. Is there any reason to believe? I mean, again, I know that we're getting better at treatment. I know that more people understand what the symptoms are. Testing continues to increase, though not to the levels we'd like. I mean, as all of that happens, how much do you think right now mortality rates legitimately are going down as a consequence of that? I think they are. I think there's no doubt in my mind when I have like poured over the data that an average person who got infected and got sick enough to be hospitalized, let's say in March in New York, yep. that person probably has a 30 to 50 percent lower likelihood of dying uh, today. That's amazing. That's I mean, amazing. Disease in we less than a year. Yeah, in, in eight, eight months, nine months, we've reduced mortality by 30 to 50%. How have we done this? A little bit through therapies, remdesivir, maybe, convalescent plasma, probably not. Dexamethasone, a steroid, I think it, really the evidence is very good that it's clearly helpful for more advanced disease. But also, I think doctors and nurses have just gotten better at figuring out how to take care of people with this disease, whom to put on a ventilator, whom not to, how to avoid get, putting somebody on a ventilator. Just a lot of stuff because we had no experience with this disease, right? And so we were making a bunch of uh, reasonable guesses based on similar diseases like this. And we've learned how to take care of this specific virus itself. Do you have any sense on whether or not you think it is likely that over the next six, nine months, we will have continued progress in mortality? There's at least one more therapy that I remain pretty optimistic about, and that's monoclonal antibodies, um, the kind that the president got when he was sick, uh, Governor uh, Chris Christie got when he was infected. But they gave me Regeneron, and it was like unbelievable. I felt good immediately. I felt as good three days ago as I do now. Um, again, the data on this is, is still very much uh, in the works. What I'm most worried about with monoclonal antibodies is that uh, back in April, May, many of us who were optimistic about this were uh, begging the government uh, to make a large investment in production, saying even if it turns out not to be useful, it will have wasted maybe some hundreds of millions or maybe a couple of billion dollars. But if it turns out to be useful, American people will want millions of doses of this. That hasn't happened. Uh, so if these therapies turn out to be useful, we just won't have much of it around. Uh, and that'll be frustrating to people uh, who, who could benefit from it. And then there is probably another 30 to 50 drugs that are being tried out. Most of them won't work, but if one or two of them do, that could make a big difference. So I remain optimistic that a year from now, this disease will be even more treatable than it is today. Okay, so that's good news on the mortality rate front. Now we gotta get to the vaccine issue. Uh, you, you've said publicly that you don't think uh, a vaccine brings this pandemic to an end. Is that because you're thinking about the first vaccines that we get that are likely to have only limited effectiveness? How much of that is about 
just inability to get enough people to actually take it. What well, give us a little bit of the Dr. Ja 101 for COVID vaccines. Yeah. All right. So I expect that this year, 2020, before the end of uh, this calendar year, we're going to have a couple of vaccines authorized. And we, for lucky, might be three or four, uh, but, but somewhere in the, let's say, two to four vaccines range. Uh, we'll start giving them out to people in early January, February. I expect the vaccines, if we're lucky, they will be 70 or 80 percent effective. And if we're really lucky, 50 to 60 percent of Americans will eventually end up getting vaccinated by May or June. And if you think about that, that's not how you bring a pandemic to a complete close. Like next July, August won't be ba won't look like the July, August of 2019, but it will look meaningfully better than July, August of 2020. So I don't want to understate the value of vaccines. I think it's going to be incredibly valuable. A vaccine that's 80 percent effective, that 60 percent of Americans take, that will have a profound effect on the level of virus in the community, will make a really big difference in lots of our lives. The pandemic won't be gone. The virus won't be gone. When a vaccine is made publicly available by the U.S., from your perspective, if, if you have access to that vaccine, should you take that vaccine immediately? Yeah, so my plan is, first of all, to look at the scientific data. Uh, and if the scientific data shows it to be effective and, and reasonably uh, safe, uh, then whenever I am eligible, there will be kind of an eligibility period of, you know, right. different people will be. Whenever I am eligible, I will go get it. And I think that's what people should do. Uh, again, th this will depend a lot on the data. So I hate making recommendations until the science is clear. But if the scientific pro process continues with the same level of rigor and carefulness that it has been done so far, I'm not going to hesitate getting a vaccine. I'm not going to ha hesitate having my elderly parents get vaccinated. Uh, and as long as there's some data on kids, I'm going to not hesitate getting my children and, vaccinated. And is, is FDA approval sufficient for the average person that isn't Dr. Ja to say, yeah, this is fine. Yeah, so there's some great scientists at the FDA and they generally make these decisions. And if we let them make the decision and don't have political appointees overruling them, then yeah, then I think FDA approval is good enough. The problem in the last couple of months is you've seen meddling from the White House where uh, they just start, just start getting involved and the FDA political appointees start really getting involved. And that I think undermines the confidence as long as that doesn't happen. So there has been some erosion in, in your view at this point? No doubt about it. I think there's been a lot of erosion. I think a lot of Americans are really hesitant uh, and, and have lost a lot of faith in both FDA and CDC. And I think it's going to be very important uh, to restore that faith because uh, not everybody needs to be able to or, or can necessarily go through and evaluate all the data themselves. Uh, we've got great scientists who are supposed to do that. That's what we pay them for. And we should let them do it. And we should, you know, and we should really... Uh, uh, let them uh, voice their assessment as opposed to letting uh, political leaders decide what the right answer is. If there's one thing that we could do differently going forward as the United States, as the U.S. government, in terms of a more effective response to this coronavirus, it would be what? What's your top, top recommendation? I mean, the single biggest overriding thing is just take the virus seriously. Stop ignoring it. Uh, every time it starts increasing, act. And literally, like you could act by enforcing a national mask mandate. That would be great. Really ramping up testing. That'd be great. Um, making some smart policies about uh, not having indoor ga gatherings of certain type. That would be helpful. It almost doesn't matter. Any of those or a combination of all of those would be really helpful. The hardest thing, the worst thing that we've done is for consistently underestimate the importance of this virus, the seriousness of it. And that's what keeps getting us into trouble. Dr. Shish Jha, thank you so much for joining me. You made the country smarter, and we really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. That's our show this week. Come back next week, and if you like what you see, and of course you did, because otherwise, why would we keep doing this host-viewer relationship that we keep managing to make more intense all the time? Why don't you take a minute to sign up for G-Zero's most excellent morning newsletter? It's called Signal.